Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Ralph Connor Memorial United Church. And thank you to our musical guest, Paul Corey. Whether you are here from Mini Snee or Banff or Canmore, from elsewhere in the Bow Valley or elsewhere in the world, we hope that you will find a place of welcome with us today. Now, if we do have any guests or visitors who'd like to stand and introduce themselves, let us know where you're from, please do. Um, you never know, here there's not many degrees of separation, so someone has probably been to your home technically. Yeah, do we have any guests with us today? We're John and Diane and Phoebe from uh, the Methodists from the United Kingdom on holiday. We do invite everyone to, uh, to stay for coffee afterwards, which is through here in the uh, Gordon Hall. On this Communion Sunday, when all are invited to join in the sacrament, we remind ourselves that both Ralph Connor here in Canmore and Rundle Memorial in Canada are affirming ministries of the United Church of Canada. We strive to live into our commitments to be places where the gifts of diversity are indeed viewed as gifts, and all are invited to full participation and a full sense of belonging. Today and every day we are on land held sacred by many Indigenous peoples. The Stony Nakoda First Nations, Chiniki, Bearspa, and Wesley, the nations of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Kainai, Pekani, and Siksika, the Satina Nation and many nations beyond the signatories of Treaty 7, including the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. They are our hosts, our neighbors, and the wisdom keepers on this land. It is with gratitude to them and a desire to walk a good walk together that we gather here today. We know that Christ is with us at all times and in all places. I'm going to try plan B here. <laughs> in worship, we signify this with the lighting of the Christ candle. Today's call to worship comes to us from the Song of Faith of the United Church of Canada. Carrying a vision of creation healed and restored, we welcome all in the name of Christ. Invited to the table where none shall go hungry, we gather as Christ's guests and friends. In Holy Communion we are commissioned to feed as we have been fed, to forgive as we have been forgiven, to love as we have been loved. We taste the mystery of God's great love for us, and in so doing are renewed in faith and in hope. So it's time to sing. Uh, our first hymn is Voices United 395, part of the family. Uh, which will also be on the screen.
let's join together in a time of prayer. We give you thanks, Creator God, for the gift of life, for the beauty of our surroundings, for the encouragement that comes to us in friendship. In the midst of those blessings, we pray these concerns for our world. We pray for the peoples and leaders of the nations, that they may be reconciled one to another in pursuit of your justice and peace. We pray for all who suffer from prejudice, greed, or violence, that the heart of humanity may warm with your tenderness. We pray especially for all prisoners of politics or religion, and for all refugees, including our extended church family in Malaysia and Nepal. We pray for all in need by reason of famine, flood, or earthquake, that they may know the help, hope of your faithfulness through the help of others. We pray for the land, the sea, and the sky, that we may live with respect in creation and use your gifts with reverence. We pray for all who suffer the pain of sickness, loneliness, fear, or loss, that those whose names are in our hearts, in the hearts of others, or known to you alone, may receive strength and courage. We pray also for those who mourn, those who mourn loved ones, those who mourn things that have changed and appear not to be changing back. God of compassion, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy now and forever. And with the closeness of a child turning to a parent, we come together in the words of our family prayer as we say, Our Mother and Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we Scripture reading comes to us from the first book of Kings, chapter 17, reading verses 8 to 16. The Lord told Elijah, Go to the town of Zarephath in Sidon and live there. I've told a widow in that town to give you food. When Elijah came near the town gate of Zarephath, he saw a widow gathering sticks for a fire. Would you please bring me a cup of water? He asked. As she left to get it, he asked, Would you also bring me a piece of bread? The widow answered, In the name of the living Lord your God, I swear that I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of flour and a little olive oil. I'm on my way home now with these few sticks to cook what I have for my son and me. After that, we will starve to death. Elijah said, everything will be fine. Do what you said. Go home and fix something for you and your son, but first please make a small piece of bread and bring it to me. The Lord God of Israel has promised you that your jar of flour won't run out and your bottle of oil won't dry up before he sends rain for the crops. The widow went home and did exactly what Elijah had told her. She and Elijah and her family had enough food for a long time. The Lord kept the promise he had, kept the promise that his prophet Elijah had made, and she did not run out of flour or oil. Here ends today's scripture. Today's reading from 1 Kings, the encounter of the prophet Elijah and the widow at Zarephath, 
is a story that invites us to see the big picture, even as we come up really, really close as well. At first glance, there's just basically the three, the three characters, a crucial need, and uh, a stated moral to the story. There is the prophet Elijah, a widow and her son, and the desperate need for food. When a perpetual supply of ingredients is provided by God so that there will be bread throughout this impending time of drought, the faithfulness of God and those who trust in God is praised. But as always, there are little details in the story that suggest bigger things are afoot here. In this case, first of all, we note the location, Zarephath, a village which was not in Israel but west of there between the coastal cities of Sidon and Tyre. There was some extremely nasty uh, political and religious energy between the place that Elijah is from, Israel, and this territory on the Mediterranean coast. Beside this, behind this, underneath this, Ahaz, the king of Israel, was married to Jezebel whose father was, yes, the king of Sidon and Tyre. And recently, many of, the king, many of the priests of Israel had been executed in favor of the priests of Baal from Sidon and Tyre. Speaking God's anger about these murders and the ease with which Ahaz was trying to turn the nation to other gods, the prophet Elijah managed to make enemies of both Ahaz and Jezebel, and has been in hiding up in the mountains. When he emerges, he comes to Zarephath in the middle, right in the middle of this conflict, in the middle of enemy territory. So this is a significant political, religious statement. Now, from a 21st century Western viewpoint, there are other questions that we see in this story, like religious privilege, patriarchy, classism, uh, sexism, as the needs of the older male prophet are dealt with before the profound needs of the young widow and her child. Now a deep dive into the expectations of hospitality in that culture will alleviate some of these concerns, but not all of them. And if we look at this story, within the bigger story of the Bible, this episode has tendrils that reach out to other stories that are also centered around prayer, such as God's provision of manna in the wilderness, sufficient for a day at a time, or the feeding of the multitude where a scarcity of fish and barley loaves, once they were blessed by Jesus and shared, were more than enough to meet everyone's needs. Now I am so thankful that in our church tradition we are encouraged to approach scripture in these big picture ways. Rather than just assuming that we know the meaning or we might remember something from Sunday school many decades ago, we are encouraged to go deeper and broader and to ask questions of our sacred text without worrying that God's going to get upset with us if we do. We bring our inquisitiveness and the work of historians and archaeologists, political scientists and sociologists, so that we can more accurately place these Bible stories within their own time and place, so that we might discern what they can say to us today. But what strikes me more about this story from First Kings is not so much these big, macro level connections. I find myself on this one being drawn right up close to the micro level. For there is this intimate, deeply emotional space in which we find the prophet and the widowed mother and the child. And as hard as it is to be in that space, I feel compelled to tarry here a while. 
Now I suppose a trigger alert would be apropos here for any of you that have some of these hard experiences in your life story. Uh, the experience of widowhood. Those of you whose bodies can recall hunger or despair. Those of you who have lived hand to mouth, not knowing where the next meal was coming from. This is a very hard space to be between Elijah and this mother and her child. Lisa Appella is a Christian blogger whose words I just discovered this week. And her life story, I think, gives a window into this biblical story. Lisa describes herself in the little about section on the blog as a recent widow and a single mom of seven amazing children. So I thought she might have something to say here. And she retells the story like so. When Elijah arrived at the Zarephath gates, he spotted a young widow gathering sticks. You can almost hear the despair in this single mom's voice, uh, words. As she told Elijah, she only had a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jar. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. She was at the end of her hope. Elijah answered, do not be afraid. He instructed her to make a small loaf for him first and afterwards some for herself and her son with this promise from God. The flour jar would not become empty nor the oil would <coughs> run dry until the day the Lord sent rain again. And so it was. In both the request and the response, we hear a sense of grim reality. The widow had no further resources in sight and resolved herself to her death and heartbreakingly to the death of her child. And into that space, into the, the hardest space I can imagine, comes this seemingly misplaced request for her to offer hospitality one more time. As Lisa puts it, this was a single mom at the end of her hope, and yet was still being asked for something. Yet amidst this stark picture of, hopeful, of hopelessness, there was hospitality, and there was provision. What I find interesting here is that the hospitality wasn't provided because she particularly believed in God. That's usually one of the reasons that these stories are told. No, in fact, she refers at one point to the Lord your God. Your God, Elijah, not my God. So even though we have here Elijah, one of the renowned prophets of Israel, it's the willingness of this woman who is outside the faith to enter into the sacred power of hospitality that opens the door to the ongoing provision of flour and of oil. No, it wasn't magical. It's not that somehow she conjured this power by doing something nice. But there is something very holy, very sacred in that type of sharing. It is impossible for us to overestimate the importance of hospitality in that part of the world, then or now. When someone was thirsty, you gave them a drink, didn't matter who the person was. When they needed food or shelter, you provided that, even if it meant you not sleeping in your usual place. There was no, if you had extra to share, it was simply understood even when you figured that this nub of flour and this splash of oil was going to be your last meal. So we have this understanding that to live in this world is integrally connected with the act of sharing the same sacred space named centuries later by Jesus in emphasizing the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Folks, I remain troubled 
that Elijah asked for food when things were so dire. And yet, in the quiet, desperate moment shared by these three people, there is also a sense of divine beauty. As we sit with these three people, we do well to acknowledge that this same exact type of despair is experienced daily in 2022 around the world by people who have nothing left, people who, like the widow at Zarephath, had no family or community supports to act as a safety net. It's funny, it was a, a question that came to me as I was looking at the text this week was, um, while I assumed that everyone in Zarephath was in rather rough shape because there was a drought, the fact that a mother and child had no one that could step up to help them in their circle um, strikes me as particularly stark. Each time we see something flash across our TV screens or we half hear something awful that has just been reported on radio, each time we see clickbait headlines about the latest attacks or food shortages or human rights violations in the world, those reported big events contain thousands of these smaller tragic spaces, like the one inhabited by this mom and her son and Elijah. We picture all these small spaces in the world today where a glimmer of hope was needed. And as we do so, we reaffirm the importance of person-to-person -person work done by human rights and humanitarian relief agencies, many with church support. And we pledge that even in our late pandemic exhaustion, we will not turn away from Christ's call to a peace that is founded in equity and justice. Even in the hardest of times, my friends, there is grace. Something small, something unexpected, something life-affirming, often accompanied by a gift of food or an offer of help. Note that the solution to the widow's problem here was not grand or showy in any way. It wasn't a new house and servants and rich food aplenty. As the story proceeds, we even see that she was not shielded from tragedy. No, this promise was the promise of enough flour and oil to get her through this day, and then the next day, and then the next day. As she prepares and shares a meal that she thinks is going to be her last one, she receives the gift of grace, one day at a time, signified and sealed in the provision of bread. We share this morning in a sacred ritual that goes back some 2,000 years, breaking the bread, sharing the fruit of the vine. We do that here in person. We do that with those who will be watching this service at home and taking communion there. We do it in our ongoing commitment to be communities of faith where the grace of our God has space to settle in and work. Whether times are good or frighteningly bad, as we feed on these symbols of grace, may we invite grace and hope and provision and peace to be with us and between us and to be mobilized through us to reach with hospitality and hope into a world of need.
set in Victoria, BC, and it's entitled, Getting Around is Not a Trivial Concern for Some. Jill visited Mission and Service Partner Our Place Society for her meals every day. At one community meal, she met an outreach worker and inquired about making a meaningful change in her life. But making the change meant that she needed accessing programs in parts of the city she couldn't easily get to without a bus pass. Too often, lack of transportation is a significant barrier that prevents people from accessing the support they need. It's hard to keep appointments, go to school, or visit family and friends with no way to travel. High gas prices, the cost of a vehicle, lack of public transit, or a system that does not reach job-rich areas are barriers to that um, are barriers to creating a better life. In a recent study, Jeff Allen and Stephen Farber report that in Canada's eight largest cities, there are nearly one million people who are at risk of transport poverty without the access they need to transit that can get them to services they need. As we see out here, the discontinuation of fully networked bus service between communities in Western Canada has made it obvious that this is a national problem extending well beyond the big cities. What does it mean to not have adequate transportation? Farber says it's a mix of disadvantages. Socioeconomic status, low income, ill health, being a recent immigrant or elderly, mixed with a lack of access to transportation, being unable to afford a car or to reach destinations easily by public transit. The time is right, he says, for a national accounting of those living in transport poverty and the development of a national transport and land use strategy. Mission and service partners working on the ground to alleviate poverty regularly help people access transportation so that they can improve their lives. The bus pass project that provided Jill with passes from the uh, Society in Victoria was supported through the United Church's Gifts with Vision Capital. So we thank you for your generosity to M and S. And speaking of that generosity, we lift up the gifts of time, talent, and treasure that allow our work in the Bow Valley to continue. Returning to one of our pre-pandemic practices on Communion Sundays, we do receive two offerings. Uh, our regular offerings for budgeted expenses and M&S donations go on the offering plates, and a benevolent offering for emergency assistance and community connections goes into the wicker baskets. Both of these will be available uh, after the service, at the main entrance, or at Gordon Hall. With that, I invite you to rise as you are able and to remain standing for the hymn that follows. And where you all are, turn to those around you and exchange with them uh, visible signs of the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you.
This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not the table of Ralph Connor Memorial United Church, nor of the United Church of Canada. It is indeed the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as such, anyone and everyone here who is seeking to follow in Christ's path is more than welcome to partake of the sacrament of communion today. On your way in today, you should have received a little cup with your communion elements. If you did not, if you came in a different way or somehow you missed that, please put your hand up now and we will make sure that you get what you need to share. Very good. Looks like we have full adherence. So that's uh, great. Afterwards, um, you can either leave the little cup in the, uh, the pew rack or we will have receptacles uh, at the door and in Golden Hall. I also wanted to say a little bit about what is here at the table. So I have uh, the grapes and, and cracker as, as you do, but also from the sacred Passover Seder, uh, we have the matzah and we have the kosher grape juice that were part of that celebration. And you'll see in the communion prayer that it reaches into the fullness of our shared history with our Jewish sisters and brothers. I felt after that time with Rick it particularly important to mark that in our first um, larger sacred meal here together. So I invite you to turn to your bulletin. Uh, there is the Great Thanksgiving Prayer, and you will see the lead lines in there for your responses. Uh, also, please note that there is a back to the bulletin today, so after we do the prayer after communion, there's a, a little bit more to the service at that point. May God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image, male and female you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel. And through your servants Abraham and Sarah gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets you renewed the, your promise of salvation. At Pentecost, fresh breezes blew down the walls which separate us from you and from one another. Flames kindled new visions of compassion and peace. Tongues uttered prophetic words of truth and justice. Therefore, with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give you thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time you sent your child Jesus Christ to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the mother and father of us all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And after giving thanks to you, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took wine. 
pressed from the fruit of the vine, and after giving thanks, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance. Gracious God, by the death of your child, you have destroyed the power of death. And by raising him to life, you have given us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come in. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again, Lord, we offer you, O oh God, the bread of this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who share these gifts may be one body, one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, God most holy, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So now we take the elements of communion, and together, we, as we take um, as we take this bread and, and the uh, the classic uh, fish symbol that was uh, that was shared by by the early disciples, it was sort of a code that they had. We take this as a remembrance of Christ. The bread of life. And together with the grape, we remember that we are connected to God and to one another with that image of it being a vine with many branches.
friends, let us share in the prayer after communion. We give thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world, united in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
the strength of Christ stronger than our need, and the communion of the Holy Spirit richer even than our togetherness, guide and sustain us today and in all our tomorrow.